So we're in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. I've titled this Big Problem on the Horizon. And of course, this is probably the most famous story in all the Bible. Back a number of years ago, gosh, it's been 100 years ago, February 22nd, 1918, Harold and Addie Mae Wadlow welcomed Robert Pershing Wadlow to Alton, Illinois. He was the first of their five children. They didn't know that Robert suffered uh, from hypertrophy of the uh, pituitary gland, causing it to produce excess human growth hormone. But by the time he was eight years old, he was taller than his dad. And by the time that he graduated from high school, he was eight foot four inches, the gentle giant of Alton, Illinois. He uh, did some what he called advertising work for the people who made his size 37 AA shoe and supplied them to him for free as long as he represented the company around the United States. And he did some traveling for that. He also traveled with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, but not as a, a sideshow act. He would simply be addressed uh, or announced and would come out onto the, uh, into the uh, big, big uh, top, as they call it, and uh, would just present himself to the crowd. And it was an impressive, you see sights uh, of him. I sh wasn't thinking about it, I should have sent you a picture. You could put up a picture of him standing next to his dad and his dad comes to his waist. And a uh, uh, very big man, he died young. He was uh, 22 years old when he died on June the 15th in 1940. He was uh, doing some appearance uh, and he wore braces on his legs and one of the braces had uh, cut into his leg and it became infected. And within a very short time, he succumbed to the, uh, the infection, even though they did operations and d tried to desperately treat him. He had a certain autoimmune uh, disease and, and he died. At the time of his death, he was eight foot 11 inches tall. So in the last couple of years, he had grown that much. And had he lived longer, he probably would have been well over nine or 10 feet tall because he just continued to grow. Uh, can carry a lot of weight. Just to give you an idea, I think he weighed 435 pounds, and he looked kind of skinny. But uh, a very big man, very strong. So we're in the chapter of giants, the giant tonight. And giants have existed since very early in the history of mankind. There were several uh, groups of, of giants that are mentioned in the scriptures. In uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the second chapter, the 10th and 11th verses, uh, God is telling him they're going to go in and they're going to take this, uh, the land. It says, and the Emims uh, dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, the, the children of Anak. And Anak was, the, was a giant. It says... Uh, 11th verse says, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So it was kind of two different people calling by the same name, but the truth of the matter was is they're the, these big people. These people were probably genetically giants. It was a hereditary condition, and, and so just the genetics can uh, create and can be passed down uh, to generations to where you would have uh, a group of, of uh, uh, giants. In Numbers, the uh, <clears throat> 13th chapter of Numbers, the 32nd and 33rd verses, we're coming to where they're getting ready to go into the land to possess the land, and they send in the spies, and the spies come back with a report, and this is the report. It says, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which, uh, which come of giants, and we were, in their, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. 
So both they and we thought that we were grasshoppers and they didn't want to go in and face these people. And you can imagine when you see somebody who is massively tall, and I've seen a few people in my lifetime, uh, you see some of the basketball players, you know, people that are, you know, seven, seven and a half feet tall in this day and age, and, and uh, it's impressive, and it can be intimidating. My older brother was a uh, policeman. He uh, retired from the Seattle Police Force, and I'm glad, he, I'm sure he's very glad that he's retired from the Seattle Police Force right now. Uh, he retired, gosh, 30, 40 years ago. He's been, been a long time. But he, my older brother is a lot bigger than me. He's probably six foot four. I'm uh, 5'11 on a good day. And uh, so he was six foot four, and he's always been big. He's just a big man. Even now, he's probably over 300 pounds. And, uh, but he's always carried a lot of weight, very strong. And he has had darker hair than me, too, and a darker beard, and he had a unibrow, <laughs> so went around. And he found that it was pretty easy to just kind of lean over to people and scowl at them, and they would kind of get in line and wouldn't, didn't want to mess with him. You know, so he, he didn't really have to get that tough with them. And these kind of people are very, very intimidating. Deuteronomy uh, 3, the 11th, chap, uh, the 11th verse uh, says uh, about Og, says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Now, a cubit exists, there's a distance from here to here, and some have, scholars have said, well, it could be as much as 22 inches, but it's about 18 inches long. And in fact, I have always found this very, very handy that when I hold my hand out like this, the distance between my thumb and my little finger is exactly nine inches. So I can kind of, you know, figure out something like that and kind of get an idea of how big something is. And, and this is about 18 inches on my hand. And so Og, the king of Bashan, he had an iron bedstead, which was unusual for a lot of people to have an iron bedstead. And he probably needed an iron bedstead for good reason, because that bedstead was nearly 13 and a half feet long. That's what nine cubits would be. So 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide and you've got to figure for Og, the man, he probably weighed between 500 and 650 pounds. And he was probably looked trim at doing that. And so you see, he needed an iron bedstead just to be able to hold his weight up during the night. So these giants have continued to this time in, uh, in the history of uh, of. Uh, Israel, and we have even giants living today. We have excessively big piece, uh, people. Uh, one of the um, uh, marks of giantism, they'll have something that's called acromegaly. Acromegaly is a, a, a very large head of a prominent brow, a very prominent brow. And in fact, it gives them very, a look of Neanderthal man. And so I don't think Neanderthal man is a less evolved human being. There's only been human beings since the beginning of time. And I think Neanderthal man was probably somebody who was suffering from acromegaly and it's passed on, it's hereditary. And so there are a number of people would have this kind of a condition. And uh, so you have an idea. Um, I'm thinking in modern times we had, I don't know if you remember the wrestler Andre the Giant. He was kind of that, had that real heavy brow like that and very big man. And that's a, a form of giantism. And so here we are. There were, were arrayed. Well, I better get back here to the first of the chapter. I have mine down a little ways. So we just ended the last story. And one of the things you have to remember between these chapters is one story has come to an end and then the next story is being told that it's not unlike uh, TV today, that we have, uh, you know, have to have a recap to uh, kind of know what's going on or what happened, especially when you've got something that was continued from last week. 
I've been enjoying, we, we for the last year have been watching a lot of the Rockford Files. Sorry, we didn't invite you over. You know, I, I apologize. <laughs> When we were young and beautiful, we all, uh, and we shared a house down in California with Ken and Vicki, and one of the things we enjoyed doing, that's when Rockford Files were, uh, were first done, and so we would watch it and have our popcorn and, and uh, enjoy the Rockford Files. Well, one of the things in the format of that TV program, they always have a recap at the beginning. They tell you the story kind of before you get to the story. And, but a lot of times they had uh, episodes that were continued. So you end one and then two. So the, you'd have to wait for a week. And so they would give you a recap so you could kind of remember, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Now they bring you up to speed, and then they can continue telling you a story. The beauty of watching it on uh, Prime is that you can just hit skip the recap and it goes right over to the introduction. And we can listen to the uh, the. Uh, phone answering machine and then hit skip the introduction and go right to the story. So we save ourselves, you know, 10 minutes worth of time by, uh, by doing that. Well, that's the way these stories are kind of done. So they are somewhat separated. We learned a lot about David and about uh, all the things and how he became uh, anointed as the king. So he's the future king. Well, now we're starting with another story, and it's after that, but they will repeat some of the same information. And, uh, well, let's see as we dive in. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together as Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in the uh, Ephes Damim. And Saul the, uh, and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. So uh, pictures all set up. You remember if Redmond is Jerusalem, then this area now we've the last battles we saw took place up here in the north in Terrebonne area and, and down. Now we're out in Tumalo, out beyond, maybe almost to uh, Paladin Estates. If you know on Highway 20 as you go out off to the left, there's Paladin Estates. Those were established, by the way, by Richard Boone, who played Paladin on the, back in the 50s on TV. So the, they have all gotten set up, and they gather their armies together, and I wonder if perhaps the army of the Philistines was a, um, a bit smaller than the army of Israel. And of course, as they start setting up for battle, you know, they're always bringing in more troops. The word goes out and people get their, get their weapons and they come and join the battle. And so the, the group is kind of growing. And so there's a, a lot of time that they spend setting up and trying to make it all work. And the... Uh, the uh, Philistines have actually come in quite a ways, see? so they're, they're really encroached upon the area of Israel because the Philistines were on the coastal areas in Ekron and Gath and, and the like. So they're quite a ways in, and the battle is set up. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel on the other. It says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. And so we see that six cubits and a span, like that, would make him, what, about nine feet, nine inches tall? Or maybe as much as 11 feet, depending on if that's an 18 inch cubit or a 22 inch cubit, an inch or two here and there can make quite a bit of difference. So here's Goliath of Gath, who's about nine feet, nine inches tall, and it talks about the armor that he has. You know, just the nine foot nine inches is impressive. You know, we don't think about I've, I've demonstrated this uh, uh, in times past. Once uh, for a Sunday school class up in Seattle doing this. And what I did is I put uh, a corpse tape on, a, on the floor, nine foot <laughs> of this dead Goliath laying on the floor. And that was impressive. One time uh, in this church, when I was... Uh, teaching from this uh, passage of scripture. Um, I have a ladder at home. It's a little giant ladder, and it's about 
it's three feet, or I can extend it to five feet, but I put it up at three foot, and then I stood on top of that ladder, and that's about how tall uh, Goliath was. And you get an idea. I would have done it tonight, but I'd be bumping my head on the, on the ceiling, and Jeff would be complaining about I'm not speaking loud enough and all that, so I didn't do that. Uh, it said that his, um, he, he had all this armor, so he has this helmet of brass on his head. That's a lot of weight. I don't know if you've ever carried a lot of weight on your head or not, but you have to have a good strong neck for that kind of stuff. It says that he was armed with a coat of mail. They probably had brass uh, plates and they were like fish scales that flopped down over one another. And it says that uh, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. A uh, shekel by weight was about a half an ounce, and so this uh, weighed about 154 pounds. I went on a little hike with my son and my granddaughters and, uh, and some other family members, and we uh, went and we hiked into Linton Lake Falls and camped there, and it was about a two-mile hike in there. Been a number of years since I'd gone backpacking. And I had my pack, and I had the stuff that I needed. And that pack weighed about 32 pounds. And I'll tell you, by the time I got in there, that two miles, I was pretty bushed. <laughs> and coming out, I didn't know, oh, maybe I'm getting too old for this kind of stuff. And I immediately went out. Instead of having a, a six-pound pack, now I've got one that weighs two pounds. And I cut the weight of some other things down, and I think I've got it down now to where I'm about to 24 pounds. It'd be nice if I could figure out. You st I started thinking like the backpackers do. You think in ounces, you know, the little bit. But I'm thinking, boy, how heavy that is. And how our soldiers today are trained to go into battle, and they carry these packs on their back that weigh 60, 75 pounds. They have to be able to carry that. And probably to Goliath, weighing, having 150 pounds on him, probably didn't affect him all that much. It says, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs. The greaves are those guards that you have for your shins. And uh, a lot of soldiers, the Roman legions, would have leather, heavy leather greaves uh, to protect their shins, a lot lighter than brass. And, but Goliath, he's a big guy, he can handle it. So he's got these heavy brass uh, greaves on his legs. And he says, on a target of brass between his shoulders, and tell, doesn't tell us how heavy that is. So this guy is going into battle, and he's probably carrying 250 pounds of armor with him. And he doesn't carry his own uh, shield. He's got a, a man who just carries his shield because that's more intimidating. And uh, it said that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And to illustrate that, I took the mast of a sailboat that I have. It's a nice spruce, beautiful straight thing, and comes to a nice point, so it almost looks like a spear. And it's very, very long. And I thought, when you stand up there and you're nine feet tall, that thing isn't so big. But it was very, very big. It said the staff was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. It's about 15 pounds at the head. That doesn't sound like much until you start throwing it. You know, then, then you know that's an awful lot of weight uh, to be having to heft. It says, and the one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel, and he said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. And if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When well, somebody that big is yelling at you and cursing at you, you take note. And this is one of those instances, maybe this is where they, uh, you know, got that saying, you know, but... Uh, 
retreat being the better part of valor or something like that. And uh, they were dismayed. It says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Very intimidating. Now, it doesn't seem likely that this is something that would actually work out in practice. You know, often thought, wouldn't it be good? Why, why don't we get the leaders of the, our nations, and when they have a conflict, sit them down at the table, let them arm wrestle, and the guy who wins, that's who wins the battle. Doesn't work that way, does it? And as you'll see, spoiler alert, uh, when we get to the end of the thing, that's not how it worked out here either. It just doesn't, it's not in the nature of man to do it this way. But it was very intimidating for him to stand there and to yell. There's a lot of pictures here for us to take as personal. There's a lot of things in our life that are very large and looming. And a lot of those things yell at us and scream at us and try to defeat us and to subdue us. And a lot of times we're like Saul and all the army. And we're just shaking in our boots and we just don't know what we can do and all that. And that's where we have to be like the man after God's own heart as he comes on the scene. So the scene shifts and goes back to David and a, uh, a description and kind of sets the stage here. It says, now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Yesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. So at that point, Jesse is an old man, and he's got the respect. He's got these eight very good strapping young men who are kind of running things, and he's the head of the clan. It says, and the three eldest sons of Yesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of these three sons, if you'll remember from the 16th chapter, were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next was Abinadab, and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest. So I guess the only important things were the three oldest guys and the youngest guys and the four that were in between, they're just kind of on their own. And I know how that goes. I was born in the middle of the family. It says, and David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. You remember what happened? The very thing that Samuel said would happen is that Saul started taking all the best of the crop, became part of his army. He conscripted them. And so it is that the three oldest boys of uh, Jesse go in, uh, and they're in the army now. It says, and it says, but David went and returned from Saul. You remember David was there. He was called in because he was really good with the harp. And he came in and he played the music and that kind of set Saul in a good mood and, and his mood changed and improved to a point that David could then go back and which is what he did. So he's serving in the household of Saul, but he's also serving his father. He goes back to his dad. Uh, David being a young man at this point, he's uh, probably in his early 20s, uh, tall. He's probably kind of skinny, not real impressive. It seems like uh, men, we start out, you know, is puny and all the girls are bigger than we are and then all of a sudden you have that growth spurt and you know and the guys grow up and they're skinny and, and all and then in your 20s you start filling out a little bit and you either put it on as muscle or else you start building a belly <laughs> and and, uh, and so when you get into that age of the your late 20s into your through your 30s you're really good shape and uh and doing well so david is now on the skinny side remember and uh, we'll see that as we come to it. He was said he was kind of reddish hair, light complected, you know. And maybe he maybe he looked kind of sickly because he was so light, and all everybody around him was uh, the darker skin. And uh, so we know how hard it is for white guys today, you know. And uh, it, may, it may have been the same for him back then. It says. Uh, 
But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening. So he's doing this twice a day. And he says he presented himself and he did this for 40 days. And they, and they call this battling. These guys, one army's over here shaking in their boots. The other army's over here rattling their spears. And uh, with their champion out there in front who is, uh, it's having an effect. This is, called, this is early psyops uh, for the army. You know, they're having psychological warfare because this is having an effect on the, uh, the men of Israel. So he presented himself for 40 days. And Yesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn. An ephah is about a half a, a bushel. It's about 22 liters. You want to, that's, that's for those of you in the back row, that's uh, 11 bottles of pot. Okay. So he uh, says, Take uh, for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. So not only give something to the boys, you know, they need to be fed. And so he's making sure that they're fed. But he also passes something on to the boys' boss so that he's fed also and would make him look favorably upon them. See, nothing changes over time. It says, he says, and look at how, they, how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now I think that might be an overstatement. The fighting hasn't really begun. Maybe they've had some skirmishes. I don't know. It says, and David rose up early in the morning, and he left the sheep with a keeper, and he took and went as Yesse had com commanded him, and he came to the trench, the valley, as the host was going forth to the fight. So they're all kind of moving around and they're trying to act, but they're not really fighting. They're mostly just yelling at each other. And uh, they shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array. They're ready, they're ready, they're ready, army against army. It says, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. Now, that does not mean he's a wagon with wheels. What it's talking about is the load that he's carrying on his back. He's got it in uh, knapsacks or bun bundles of some sort, and he's carrying that. That's what his carriage is, is what he's carrying. And he gives that to the keeper, and he ran into the army, get into the thick of things, there's excitement going on, and he came and he saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, they're trying to find out what's going on. He wants to get the scoop, the inside story. And while he's talking with them, there came up the champion of the, Philist uh, of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spake according to the same words. So all the things that he's been saying for the last 40 days, he says it again. Only this time, he's saying it in the hearing of David. And David is made of different stuff than all the other men of the armies of Israel. That's why he's been chosen to be the king. He has a different attitude towards God, which gives him a different insight to the men around him and the battle that is set before him. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him. So they're getting ready, and they're rattling their swords. They come up, and then Goliath steps out, and the old army steps back from it. And they were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to divide Israel is he come up. And it shall be the man who killeth him. The king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now that would be a motivation for me, not the daughter, the free in Israel. <laughs> that means that his family would not be taxed anymore in Israel. Think, now there's a, there's a reward. Because just as Samuel had said to them early on, you get a king, he's going to take what you have. 
It's the nature of government. It's the nature of power. It's the nature of people who aspire to be in charge is to try to take more and to control more. Nothing has changed since the beginning of time. So the scuttlebutt's going around here and they're talking and David is hearing this. Oh, there's going to be enriched with great riches. He'll get give him his daughter. I don't know that that was a great bargain. Uh, Michal did not seem to me to be a, a real bargain wife, but uh, that's another story for later on. And But being free in Israel, I like that. And David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou might see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and he spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. So he just says the same thing. What's wrong with you people? That we let this guy stand out there and defy the army of the living God? We are the one who serve the maker of heaven and earth. We have on our side the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. Why are we shrinking back in fear? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. It immediately gets back to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. He says, I'll go do it. You know, don't let him come out here again and say this. I'll go fight him. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him, and I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. You know, he's probably not wrong there. If he was able to prevail over a large cat and a bear, even a small bear, he's dealing with something that's excessively strong and very, very agile. And yet he was able to overpower both of those animals and to dispatch them. And you wonder why in the earth would God let David out there in the field taking care of the sheep, why would he let him encounter a lion and a bear? Doesn't he know that he could be killed? God knows everything. And the experience that David got from fighting those two animals prepared him for this day. Because he could look out there and with confidence say that the battle belongs to the Lord. And that man has got nothing over me. So... Seeing, he says, uh, the, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. You see, David's anger is not kindled by something personal. He doesn't see this as a threat against him. He sees this as an affront to God. And as an affront to God, 
He reacts in righteous anger. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me, the Lord that delivered me, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will, he will, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. You see, in triumph in all the events of our life, whatever that event is, whatever that Goliath that presents itself to us, God is able to deliver us. And he says this with a confidence. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul, like so many, when we encounter someone who is, has a zeal for the Lord, said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And then Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. Saul was a, a, a big man. Remember, he's head and shoulders above all the other guys around him, and I don't think David is head and shoulders above. He's just ordinary. And sometimes we think that to go into the battle, we have to be head and shoulders. We have to be something special. But you know what? God seeks to empower those who are ordinary. He seeks to empower those who don't see themselves as gloriously victorious in the, fight, in the face of danger. And that's where God does some of his finest work, is with those who will yield themselves to him. And are willing to place their trust in him. Jesus himself said that the thing that pleases God is that you believe him. Just believe him. And respond to him that way. And David does just that. He says, he essayed to go. For he had not proved it. So he's going to, oh, how can I move in this? And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these. For I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand. And he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Down there in the valley. I don't know if the water was running then. But there's smooth stones. Wherever you go down in a valley. You know you see where the waters run. And the rocks are nice and smooth. Get those river rocks. And he took five smooth stones. This is the place in any good sermon that we would be able to come up with, you know, maybe five of the seven deadly sins and have the stones going to strike them down, just like struck down Goliath and all of that. And you think, well, why would he choose five stones? And I feel that it is because David had full confidence in God. And he chose a stone for Goliath. And he chose a stone for Lami. Goliath's brother. And he chose a stone for Ishbikanab, Goliath's son. And he chose a stone for Safpe, Goliath's son. And he chose a stone for the one I call Kiefer. You remember the uh, TV program called 24? I think that, and I only watched a few episodes of it, but I, I believe the premise is it's everything that's taking place in a 24-hour period. And the, the uh, star of that show was Kiefer Sutherland, Kiefer Sutherland. So I'm going to call this guy Kiefer because he's unnamed, but he had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. He had 24. So we'll call him Kiefer. I think that's why David took five stones. And ultimately, either David or someone who was working in concert with David took the life of each one of those giants who defied the living God. He says he took these 
five, five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had. So it's kind of like a purse. Oh, gosh. They had man purses back then. <laughs> but they didn't have jeans, honestly, no pockets. So you can't blame them for doing that. But now that we have pockets, I hope that the guys don't get man purses, OK? Just don't do that. I had a friend who worked with me for about five years. And uh, we did the jobs together, the window jobs. and. Uh, one day, Fred shows up, and he's got kind of, it looked like a pocketbook, you know, had, and he kept stuff in that, you know. And I, I made fun of him. <laughs> it's what I do. <laughs> and he left it in my truck by accident. And so I went home, and Elliot and I saw it, and we were laughing about Fred's purse. So we went in, and we got some lipstick and a compact and some other stuff like this, and we stuffed it in his, in his man bag there. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't think he appreciated it very much, but <laughs> we had fun doing it. So here he is stuffing it in his man purse. And uh, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand. And you know what? David has spent years slinging rocks with that sling. Got pretty good at it, pretty good. Remember my dad telling the story of working at Swift and Company in Portland, and it was a great big building. And downstairs in the basement where they took their break, they had these big pillars that were probably, uh, or they were wood, uh, it's you know supports, and they were about 18 inches square, supporting this whole big building that it was in. And so the young men would go down there, and of course, Swift and Company was a meatpacking plant, and so in meatpacking plants you have knives and and you have ha uh, cleavers. And these guys would stand back and throw the cleavers and stick them in those pillars. And they got pretty good at it. And this one guy said, watch me. And he took two. Pew! And he threw them. And the old guy that was there looked at him and said, wow, that's really good. Can I try that? And he said, sure. And the old guy took four cleavers and Stuck him. <laughs> He'd been doing it for many, many years down there. This was not a new thing. And I can imagine the hours that David spent plinking rocks, hitting targets, doing target practice. He could shoot over that, that bottle at a 100 yards. He got good at it, really good. And he's got this sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came out and drew near unto him. So they're getting closer and closer. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And he's just looking really tough and angry. And when the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he disdained him. He underestimated his foe. He looks down on him and he sees he's just a kid. This is just a kid. He was ruddy and of a fair countenance. He didn't even have a good tan. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? You're coming out here with sticks. You don't have a, a sword. You don't have a club. You don't have a shield. You don't have a mail, a, a coat of mail. You don't have a helmet. You don't have any kind of protection. You come out here in your little, you know, shepherd skirt with a slingshot, and you think you're going to have do something? He says, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. I don't know about you, but I think I would be intimidated by that. That's why God did not choose me to be king of Israel. He chose David. It says, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 
This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and the, all, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Oh, the confidence of what this man has just said. How strong this is. That he's not only going to feed Goliath to the birds, but he's going to feel, give the, the bodies of, of the army to the birds of the field. And it's not about the armament. It's about who you're up against. And what Goliath doesn't know is that he is puny in the sight of God Almighty. That he has no standing whatsoever. And God, the creator of heaven and earth, who is bigger than everything, and yet is able to place himself within a single human heart. God looks down on this man with derision, and he gives words to this young, inexperienced shepherd boy that he can speak with the greatest of confidence and declare that when we're done, everybody is going to know that there is a God in Israel. It would do us well to spend hours practicing as we tend the sheep, that as we face the Goliaths of our life, that we would have the confidence. Get thee behind me, Satan. For God, who is bigger than all, is able to take care of my need at this time. And when all is said and done, all those around me are going to know that there is a God in Redmond. And he is able to deliver. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and he came and he drew nigh to meet David. That David hasted. He didn't run. He ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and he took thence a stone and he slang it. I like that one. And he slang it, and he smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead. It had to have cracked his skull. And he fell upon his face to the earth. It just stopped him in his tracks. Now, I don't want to take anything away from David, but that was a pretty big target. And you know, as is the case with giantism, these guys, they look very impressive. And I would imagine that the voice of Goliath of Gath was probably as great as his size. I can just imagine he's a man with a low voice and just rumble out there. And he, he didn't have trouble uh, being heard in the back rows. When I was... Uh, Young boy growing up here in Redmond, the uh, pastor of the Powell Butte Christian Church was Penny Penhollow. Penny was not a, not a real big guy. I don't suppose he was uh, too much taller than me now, I suppose, a little more rotund than I am. But uh, he had a voice that was huge. That man could speak and could preach. He always projected, and you could hear him in the back row. And if there was a whole group of people singing, you could hear him singing above everybody else. He just had this magnificent voice. I didn't get that voice. I 
often wished I did, but I, I didn't. But what I did get from Penny Penhollow was a challenge to become a part of the kingdom of God. And I responded to that back in that summer of 1958. We were at a boys' camp out at, out at uh, Tumalo, uh, near uh, Tumalo Falls, Skyliner Lodge. And when he made the invitation after preaching that night, I went forward. And the next Sunday morning, I went forward at church, right over here in the Christian church, and made a profession of faith. And I'm forever thankful that Penny was the faithful man that he was. And so I'm thinking Goliath probably had that kind of a voice and was that impressive. But as a giant, he was probably not all that ad agile. You know, probably big, but not like a cat on his feet. And so he was a big target. And you see them, he hit the mark. He put it right where he wanted it to go. You know, it's kind of like hockey. You know, hockey is a game where you get these, uh, I can't remember the number of hockey players there are. I'm just not that good of a sports fan, I guess. But you have these two teams going. And they have these sticks and they have a hard, really hard rubber puck. And the object of the game is to hit that puck so it goes into the net and there's a goalie there in the neck, in the net. And the object of the game is to make that puck fly so it goes just below his face guard and right above his chest pad and hits him right here in the neck. I think that's the goal of, that's, that's the object of the game of hockey. Well, he put it right exactly where it needed to be. And it stopped Goliath right in his tracks, and he's immediately unconscious. Whether he killed him with that stone, I don't know. The last time I talked about this, I said, if you think that a stone can't kill you, hitting you in the forehead, you've obviously never ridden a motorcycle at 75 miles an hour without a face guard and had a June bug hit you in the face. <laughs> you know that that stone could have killed Goliath right there. He stops, he falls flat on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he smote the Philistine and he slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. All he had was this little slingshot. And therefore David ran, and he stood upon the Philistine, and he reaches down, and he took his sword, and he drew it out of the sheath thereof, and he slew him and cut off his head. Just exactly what he said he was going to do. Because when you sever the head from the body, you know without a doubt that that person is dead. And there is no doubt in the whole crowd on either side of the valley as to who had prevailed. Because there stood David with the head of Goliath in his hand. And when the Philistines saw the champion was dead, they immediately laid down their arms and they went over and said, okay, we're your servants now. Oh, I guess it doesn't say that, does it? No, it says they fled. <laughs> And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. They ran right back into the Philistine country, right up to their cities. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sha'arim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. They're just bodies everywhere they have just massacred these people. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. They went in there and took the stuff that they had. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his armor in his tent. So he kind of kept a souvenir. He said, ah, I think I can drag this back. And he takes it back to his tent. And when Saul saw... David go forth against the Philistine. He said unto Abner, his 
captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? You think, wait a second. What's wrong with you, Saul? Didn't you just read the last chapter? Come on, get with the program. And I'm thinking, you know, Saul's not any different than a lot of people who become into positions of importance. They're just a little bit too important to really remember who everybody is. <laughs> we needed some music at that time. And so it is that Saul is kind of that way. He's completely forgotten about that. And Abner, who should be knowing, he's like the chief of staff, uh, he said, I can't tell. And the king said, inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul and with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said unto him, whose son art thou, young man? You know, it's kind of like, who was that masked man anyway? <laughs> Whose son art thou, young man? And David answered, I'm the son of thy servant, Yesse, the Bethlehemite. You know, don't you, don't you remember me? <laughs> remember who I am? Well, I'll tell you what. As we go forward, Saul's going to remember who David is. There's no forgetting who David is. Let's close in prayer. Well, Lord, we come before you recognizing that we are but dust. We have never been brought to a real battle. We don't know what our capabilities are. We desire to be useful to you and to be a part of your kingdom, but we recognize that we are but dust. And so we take heart by what you did with this young shepherd boy. That you turned him into a giant killer. You turned him into a fearless defender of the faith. And you set in motion before our eyes to observe a lineage that brought about the Savior of our very souls. And we stand in awe. Your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. But Lord, we desire to delve into them. And we take heart knowing that you have reached out to us and you have ministered by your word that we can have confidence in what you can do. And so, Lord, I pray that as this week unfolds, that we would have opportunity to be used of you, to experience your triumph, to have this bravery of spirit that you gave to David. Give us some of that also, Lord, we pray. We uh, rejoice, Lord, that you have brought us together tonight. And we rejoice that you will gather us again on Sunday. And I pray that you would walk with us step by step all the hours in between then and now. Lord, you to be praised, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.